So uh, I have the pleasure to uh, hand over the presentation to uh, Hans Lashevsky, which is going to uh, start with his presentation and continue with his colleagues. So Hans, uh, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Jesus, thanks a lot for the intro. And uh, <clears throat> I'm really pleased to receive uh, for you all the opportunity to present a little bit uh, the requirements uh, and what is really going on in the market. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, I like to make you familiar with the agenda. I hope everybody can see the screen. Uh, we will talk today about UL Solutions first. Uh, that is definitely together with the second part, the certification process itself, my part. Then uh, we will have someone talking about lighting products, IT devices, controls, and finally about the regulatory requirements for wireless devices, which are different uh, in the marketplace. And finally, we will come up with some marketing uh, topics in regards to UL, how we can finally support your activities in case you intend to go to North America, so to USA and Canada. So <clears throat> the donkey always starts first, I say, and uh, it's me, it's Hans Laszewski. I'm the business development manager for the lighting industry here in Europe. I have some global rec uh, global tasks uh, in case of global market access. Uh, I'm in lighting since 28 years and finally I joined UL in 2018. The second part will be covered by Andrea Panzeri. He is one of our senior product service specialists. He joined UL in 2005. He is familiar with all lighting products and the requirements which are somehow formulated in the UL standards and in the IEC standards. So his uh, topic is definitely to communicate and optimize, uh, optimize the process between our sales team and the operations. And he is, as mentioned, uh, highly experienced when it comes to technical questions in this field. Second part, uh, which uh, deals finally with batteries, information technology equipment, consumer pro electronic products and micromobility is covered by Jakub Kranski. Uh, he is located in Poland, in Warsaw, and uh, he is uh, already uh, in this uh, field since 16 years for UL. <coughs> Davide Nardo will cover the part of controls and components. He is working for us since 15 years in electrical and electronical engineering. And uh, we will close the presentation with uh, the requirements in regards to EMC and wireless products, which is finally covered by Joachim gomez -Sarano. Okay, let me talk uh, very, very briefly about UL. Uh, we are in the marketplace since 125 years. We have employees and uh, facilities in over 40 countries. And finally, our customer base is located in over 100 countries worldwide. As you can see, wherever you are, you could expect we are also uh, available. So we have a strong North American uh, base, but as you can see, even in Europe, we have a lot of labs which are really spread around the countries. And even if you produce, for example, in, in China or in Southeast uh, Asia, we are already there so we can support your activities. Now we are usually facing the, I would say, the perception that UL is the standard organization that finally tests the standards. This is not correct. We have three different brands in place. We today as a team are coming from UL Solutions. We are the testing guys. The standards are developed by UL Standards and Engagement. This is a non-for-profit organization. And as soon as we talk about standards, any, other, uh, any stakeholders 
uh, in the market are involved. So it's not only UL that is finally drafting the standards. In addition to that, we have a non-for-profit research institute. And as mentioned, uh, standards and engagement and research institutes are both brands which are not for, not for profit. I always say those guys are working for fun and we are the ones doing the testing. And uh, unfortunately, we invoice our activities. Nevertheless, let's talk a little bit about the certification process itself. <clears throat> As mentioned, um, first of all, the certification of products is always based on standards and involved is not only UL standards and engagement. There are in the standardization process always uh, stakeholders from the industry, from consumers, from authorities and other certifiers like ETL and CSA. And finally, if there are additional parties interested, they can participate in such a standardization process. And finally, based on this uh, standards, which are uh, agreed, uh, the certification will finally be based. What is a little bit different compared to the European market, all manufacturers are finally um, involved in an ongoing factory surveillance process. Uh, this is done two to four times a year. So if you have a factory uh, that is involved in the production of your product, uh, it will be definitely uh, a place where our inspectors show up in order to verify and check that the products are really produced in a way as it has been certified. And finally, in the marketplace, you will always have uh, a surveillance team running around, having a closer look at the products, whether they comply with the requirements or not. There are two major uh, federal regulation systems in place. That is the FCC, mentioned in the upper left corner. Uh, the FCC takes, play, it takes care for all the requirements which deal with the wireless uh, communication and EMC topics. And finally, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, which is important for the products because they finally decide who is one of the national testing labs which is registered and can perform such, perform, uh, such safety tests. There are other uh, regulators like the Consumer Product Safety Commission, CPSC, and uh, you may have heard already about the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. But for us today, FCC and OSHA are the most important ones. Why? The OSHA finally uh, outlines all products and product categories which require an independent third party certification by an NRTL. This is quite comparable uh, to the European system because you have some products like products which use gas or high pressure that needs to be certified by a registered uh, certifier. And uh, the same topic here is covered by OSHA. And we are very often asked, especially when it comes to Lighting products are lighting products, products that need a third party certification by an NRTL. To be honest with you and to clarify all the rumors in the market, there is no legal requirement by OSHA that such products need to be tested by an NRTL. Nevertheless, there is always an exception to the rule. Uh, handheld luminaires which are used in a hazard location that are somehow required to be tested. But nevertheless, you will see immediately in the next slide that there is some pressure to the manufacturers to test the products which should be sold in North America. And we come to it in a few seconds. Again, as mentioned in the intro video, the OSHA finally uh, is, re, is the authority that deals with the nationally recognized testing laboratories, the so-called NRTLs. Uh, you can jump to the web page and you can see all the NRTLs which are somehow re registered by the OSHA. And uh, then you can figure out 
who is the most uh, I would say the one you can finally use because there is a long list of standards uh, they can test. Not all NRTL laboratories finally test all kinds of products. And uh, so you need to figure out which one is the right one for your product category. And you assume it correctly, UL can do it at least for the products we are talking here today about. So on the right hand side, you already see in the, in the slide here on the right hand side, the CULUS listed mark and the FCC that uh, shows that the product is in compliance with the requirements. What, what has been mentioned also in the intro video is finally the National Electrical Code. This is finally published by the NFPA which is a global non-for-profit organization with, which deals with the, I would say, risk of fire. And what and they like to, uh, yeah, I would say, take care for this topic. And they issue finally the US electrical safety standards. So this national electrical code is uh, the one that is used in order to have a closer look at the installation itself. And uh, all the so-called authorities having jurisdiction uh, are uh, basing their results on those national electrical codes. So they look at the installation and they take care for it, that it is a safe one, so that finally no fire risk uh, is existing in public buildings. What is important uh, here is the so-called Article 90, because as soon as your product is certified by an um, NRTL, there is no need, for example, for the fire marshal to look at the product. They will just check that the product has been approved and checked and certified by an NRTL. And there is no further discussion about the product. In case it isn't, uh, he might say, okay, we do not open the building. And uh, finally, you need to show that you are in the, uh, I would say that you fulfill the requirements which are formulated in the different standards. So this is very, very important because we have uh, seen it several times that products being in the marketplace, not being certified have finally caused such uh, results. And again, the local building inspectors, mechanical inspectors or fire marshals, they can finally say, okay, I do not release the certificate of habit habitability, and then you are really in a trouble. So comparing this system in the US uh, with the, the EU one, uh, as you can see from the bottom to the top, uh, on the right-hand side, you are familiar with the CE marking, which is a mandatory marking here in Europe but it is finally issued on a self-declaration. Uh, the requirements here are formulated by OSHA in the US market or in the North American market. Uh, the technical requirements you find in the standard that is uh, quite similar. A lot of standards uh, are already harmonized between North America and the IEC world, but not all of them. Lighting is especially one which is not harmonized. So the uh, requirements for lighting products in the US are really different to those you are facing here in Europe. And finally, uh, there is, uh, as mentioned on the right-hand side, the conformity assessment uh, where the manufacturer usually can declare to be in compliance with the requirements by themselves. Uh, if uh, something like this uh, would have been uh, done in the US, you need finally an NRTL. And uh, what the main, main problem is in the North American market that the liability laws uh, fine you very, very hard in case you are not in compliance and someone is hurt. Uh, in the EU, you have the EU directives, which tells you uh, what is uh, really required at this point. So again, the main, main difference here is if you want to show compliance with the requirements, then there is more or less no other opportunity but to go to an NRTL and approve the product. So <clears throat> the compliance uh, is really crucial and companies pay really high costs 
in case a product uh, fails in the marketplace. Uh, I think this is a um, known fact when it comes to product um, placement in North America, and I do not like to continue with this topic. Uh, I would like to jump immediately in the certification process itself. Uh, what is usually done, uh, first of all, if you show up with a product, with an end product or with a component of an end product, and there is a construction analysis, that is a first step. From the construction analysis, our engineering team will finally decide what needs to be tested. Uh, and uh, then finally, after the testing, they will do a documentation. Uh, the documentation again will be reviewed and then there will be the decision for the certificate itself. And uh, ahead of all productions, there will be a so-called initial production inspection of the manufacturing location where you intend to produce this product. And this is called the IPI. And here it is important, usually this IPI should be done ahead of the first production. Yeah? So first of all, there should be the inspection of the manufacturing location, and then you can start producing the products for the North American market. So this uh, initial production inspection, that is really very, very important to notice because it will definitely influence the timeline for you to go to market. Then finally, after the IPI, you can, uh, you get the um, yeah, author, the authorization to apply the safety mark. It could be an UL mark or an ETL mark or CSA mark. And then finally, you will face several visits in the factory location every year where you produce the product. There is one difference. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see this uh, the so-called UL mark, so C. Uh, in the lower left corner stands for Canada and US for USA, simple. Um, this shows finally that the product complies with the requirements in Canada and the USA. Most of the products we test are certified immediately for Canada and US because the standards are harmonized in most cases. So uh, it is definitely beneficial for you to apply and ask for a CULUS. Um, and if you are just delivering a component that is finally used in an end product, you will not receive a CULUS, but you will uh, get this UL recognized component mark, which shows that your product is in compliance. And that is very important because uh, in case uh, you like to deliver and produce such a component, uh, it is important for the manufacturer who is finally producing the end product uh, that such component, components are already recognized because then he saves a lot of time and money. So again, components should be somehow certified because in case they are already recognized and uh, are used in the end product, then finally you have a, a very short time of certification. So it is really important that the components are somehow recognized already. Uh, important in the first step of the construction analysis is that uh, everything is checked, first of all, from a visual point of view. Then you have some electrical and mechanical, uh, mechanical diagrams, which we need to have, a, an, I would say, a precise look into the product. And then uh, with a list of components, uh, we check whether there is already uh, certified components included. There will be definitely an analysis whether the compo components are used in the right way, for example, from an, uh, I would say, environmental perspective, whether the temperatures are fine and so on. And finally, we will have a look at the manuals, at the labels, which you need to stick to the products. And then finally, the test program will be uh, defined and then the test takes place. 
And again, usually what you generally do is you start with an idea of a product, you come along with a design, you do some prototyping and analysis, analysis whether it's fine, and then you take your finished product to the uh, yeah, certifier. In this case, it could be UL. But in case of North America, we recommend, highly recommend that you do it in a different way. So first of all, uh, with the idea, you should start and contacting us because due to the fact that the standards are different, we, make, we can make you familiar with the requirements. And for this requirements and that you really fulfill them, there, uh, there is very beneficial a so-called UL preliminary investigation of the design. And uh, with the prototyping, then uh, we do the preliminary investigation. We come along with an analysis and then finally we can certify the product so we can influence your design so that it really meets the requirements. And with this last slide and recommendation to start with a uh, preliminary investigation, I hand over the presentation to Andrea Panzeri. Andrea, thank you all. The Good stage morning. Is yours. Good morning, all. <laughs> so let's talk about some examples of lighting products that can be uh, certified. You can go ahead, please, Hans. So, uh, firstly, uh, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, components, uh, as uh, say, uh, Hans uh, said uh, before. Uh, we have one main standard to certify lighting component that is UL8750 that is almost harmonized with the correspective CSA standard, so the 2M50-13, uh, and it covers LED drivers uh, or LED controller and both uh, LED module. Uh, these components uh, are the one that can have uh, a direct interface also with communication protocol, such as, for example, uh, the KNX, and uh, uh, are intended to be used within an end product that typically is a, a luminaire. Uh, then uh, we have uh, a main standard, uh, the, not the only one, but the, the main one, that is UL1598, harmonized with the uh, CSA250.0, that covers uh, luminaires intended to be connected directly to a branch circuit, so 1 and 20 volt or 277 or 347 volts, 60 years, with a permanent uh, installation. Uh, it covers uh, both surface mounted C, uh, installation and recess installation, and it covers indoor and as well outdoor installation. Next one, please. So here are uh, some uh, small example of what uh, we discussed. LED driver uh, can be with or uh, without uh, the frame. Uh, it can be supplied with a line volt directly with a branch circuit, so line voltage supply, and it can include a transformer, but it is it can also be supplied by a low voltage DC source, and then we have typical example of an LED module. Uh, it can be linear as well as a matrix uh, uh, or different shape. And then uh, we have uh, Luminar. The pictures show a typical suspension Luminar, but as I told you, the main standard covers also other type of installation. Thank you. So now I think it's uh, time to switch over and uh, whose turn is it? Sorry, I forgot it. <laughs> the IT device, I think. It is uh, Jacob. It's Jacob, yes. <laughs> so go ahead, please. Jakob, can you turn on your camera, please? 
One sec, I'm going to check that everything's okay on his side. Okay. Now I'm with you. Can you hear me all? <laughs> yes. Great. I, I was turned off by, by Jesus here. <laughs> okay. So now going with IT devices. Okay. Um, yes, actually, IT devices is a very large uh, group of different, very different products. And Hans, can we move to another uh, uh, slide, please? Thank you. So, so that's a huge group, right? And uh, fortunately, fortunately, harmonization between IEC and European standards and you American standards it's here and it's present for a top groups at least right but before I go to that, uh, one thing which is I think very important right is uh, something that Hans said um, and, you know during his presentation um, plenty of the IT devices might fall into into mandatory OSHA requirements actually per mandatory OSHA requirements you would have to do a certification for them because of the um, environment they are used in, right? But of course, plenty might fall uh, um, outside. And the question is, should you do the certification or not? In such a case, you have to consider two additional factors. One is really requirements of your distributors, retailers, distribution channels, your customers, really, what they expect from you in order to distribute, sell, and buy your products, even if they are not using OSHA mandatory certification environments, they might still require you to do a certification. That's one thing. Second thing is really something to protect yourself really on the market. You have to remember you're selling this in US, right? If something happened and it's caused by your product, certification protects you, right? So you have to consider also the risk associated with selling the product, which is not certified, even if it's not required to be certified, right? Certification always supports you as a manufacturer right and protects you on the market uh, from potential court cases and and uh, um, you know any, any uh, problems let's say related to that so as I said uh, plenty of the products um, in which are uh, on the market in a selling on the market sold on the market in US for in ITE group uh, fall under 6256A-1 standard so UL standard is harmonized with IC so it's also similar to European standard and this category uh, scope is exactly the same as it is in Europe generally speaking um, but of course we have other categories and groups which are let's say a little bit different so for example batteries right batteries might fall into different standards pure american standards in um, uh, and that could be a difference than uh, than to, uh, for europe uh, we have different considerations in terms of lasers we have cdrh requirements are uh, being added right we have also smaller groups of um, products considered to be uh, consumer electronics and it devices for example robots or augmented virtual and mixed reality where different new standards are being introduced to the market, um, which might not be yet mandatory, but they are just different than those used in Europe. Uh, or actually there is nothing in Europe currently that can be really compared with those standards, right? So that's that's something to consider as well. Additionally, please remember about energy efficiency schemes, which are mandatory, legally mandatory uh, for many products which are in uh, um, IT sector. Uh, and sometimes they are being forgotten. And these uh, three schemes you see here, ERP is of course for Europe, but DOE is Department of Energy in US, CEC is uh, California Energy Commission, and NRCAN is a Canadian um, scheme for energy efficiency. Please check if your products are falling into mandatory uh, certification and testing requirements. Hans, can we move forward? Yeah, because uh, the previous slide was more, more on end products. The, you remember have to remember about uh, components. Here are some example standards about the batteries. Uh, the components need to be certified, as has mentioned during the um, previous um, uh, previous slides. So, for example, uh, PCBs need to be safety certified. Electrical uh, components, uh, plastic components need to be certified. You have to mer ha have it in mind before going to US, um, before supplying the product for a certification, um, uh, reviewing the and construction, for example, due by yourself or using the preliminary investigation service, as, as Hans mentioned, could be very uh, helpful to identify the critical components and checking they are really certified. Uh, Hans, next slide, please. Yeah, and an example from my side, as you can see, a quite a simple camera, right? And uh, the camera that we can see in many uh, applications and places uh, in 
you know, all commercial but also residential areas. Uh, if you go for your uh, European, uh, sorry, American, uh, um, American market, USA uh, and Canada, this can be classified uh, as a home office of business commercial use, IT, under scope of UL and CSA 6256A-1 standard. You can actually in US right now use one of two editions, second edition or third edition, uh, where third edition is probably more suggested as um, it's just newer, right? And can be used for compliance with uh, American um, uh, American market. Um, you have to consider different uh, potential usages, environments that the camera is used in. This is very important to learn when you are submitting the product for certification to understand what are the all the features and uh, environments that the camera like this is used. For example, if it's used in outdoor, environment, then uh, outdoor uh, use evaluation needs to be run, which is included in the third edition of 62568, or if you are using second edition, 6950-22 needs to be additionally applied. Uh, as an extra, which is not mandatory, but as an extra, your customers might require you to do IP, ingress protection testing, uh, and or NEMA testing, which is very much used in US, um, which is similar to IP, I mean, the same um, requirements, uh, let's say the same requirements in the sense of IA ingress protection, but different levels of acceptance uh, are there and uh, some, some differences in testing. So generally speaking, um, you might need to do extra IP testing and NEMA testing, even if it's not required per 6268 standard, right? Uh, you have to bear in mind the critical components, which I mentioned be before. So printed wiring boards, uh, batteries, if you use batteries there, they need to be certified per uh, specific standards, which are listed here. You need to consider if you're using using lasers or high power LEDs in the, such products, then additional optic radiation evaluation of such a camera is required. And as an extra in US uh, for lasers, right, uh, CDRH report needs to be issued and submitted and registered into FDA, right? That's something uh, which you might um, not be aware of. Uh, all the products using lasers sold in US needs to have CDRH rate reports and they need to be registered to FDA, right? That's something you need to have in mind. Other, you know, uh, top components that you have to consider, for example, power supplies needs to be also certified, right? So uh, what we suggest is really providing to, to us when you're really uh, aiming for certification, a specification of the product with the features and um, environments you, it is used in. So we can really uh, have a look we can apply and suggest uh, the, the correct standards. Uh, we can check if there are lasers requirements applicable, outdoor uh, requirements applicable. We can check the extra things which potentially might be needed by your customers and suggest. So we can ask your customers if they need this or not. And we can together uh, limit the scope of the evaluation to the, to the one which is really required. With this, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Hans, we can move forward. Yeah, and as far as I remember it correctly, it's now Davide who is taking yeah. over. Thank you, Hans. Now, the next example is about the controls that are used in uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. In this case, the, stand the domain standard that we are uh, using is uh, UL and CSA 60730. That is a standard series consisting of a generic part, the part one that reports the uh, general requirement uh, related to the product safety and functional safety. So we are talking about the minimum set of safety requirements that has to be considered in order to put in the market a product that is considered as safe, because these are really the, minimums, the minimal uh, threshold to be, uh, to be fulfilled in order to, to, uh, to build product having a residual risk that is in line with the tolerable risk uh, accepted by, by the society, in this case, the, the uh, North American market. In addition to the part one, we have uh, a different part two that are the, uh, st the specific standard that has been um, written in order to cover a specific type of control, like we have like dash two, dash nine related to the sensing, temperature sensing control, or we have like dash two dash fourteen related to the uh, electrical actuators. The advantage here is that this standard is uh, uh, harmonized with uh, a international standard that is the IEC sixty seven thirty. So basically, both 
US and the Canadian market decided to use this international standard and this was translated into uh, um, dedicated the, the local standards, so UL and CSA, putting just the national deviation like uh, the uh, type of uh, distribution, uh, uh, specific requirement for distribution, different uh, rules about installation and so on. So here the advantage is working well that we are able to cover both part so international and uh, and uh, north american and we can provide uh, uh, the, the both let's say service for global and north american uh, assets in the same in the same uh, evaluation same session this is the standard that is uh, required by all uh, the end product standards so when we are talking about heating ventilation air conditioning we could have different end product standard some of them are UL legacy standards, so something that has been directly written by, by UL, like UL 174, for, for instance, for um, storage heater. Uh, whereas uh, we have other standards that are still um, harmonized with uh, the IEC 6035, like uh, all the refrigeration application, like uh, for uh, uh, commercial refrigeration, we are talking about uh, the UL 6035-2-89. But anyway, all these standards refer to the uh, control, and in uh, in order, and this control has to be certified along with 6730. And Hans, please go to the next slide. A good example about a product that, that involves a KNX uh, communication feature is exactly. Uh, what is called building automation control system BAC is S uh, the acronym. In this case, we are talking about uh, in a commercial uh, or uh, residential building the, the system that is involved not only for to 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 monitor to regulate different kind of features such as uh, uh, humidity, uh, heating, uh, and uh, automation of uh, lighting uh, or uh, uh, curtains and so on. So uh, this, this standard 6730 is uh, the standard that is also uh, applicable on this kind of product and is able to cover all the also the sub component of this uh, control system. So we are talking about like as shown by uh, by the slide, we are talking about the user interface, but then also uh, this standard is also to cover the control unit that is uh, mounted inside the wall or in the control cabinet and also the at, at output part so like a linear actuator that is to go into open or close the fine coil for instance so uh, in this case this is a comprehensive standard able to cover all these kind of things from the product safety and functional safety point of view this is the last uh, topic and so i leave uh, the floor to joaquim thank you davide um so up to here, what you have heard is um, electrical safety requirements, especially electrical safety requirements for the North American market. Um, you always need to consider that uh, to access a specific market, you may need to um, identify what are the different requirements for market access. So CE marking, you may have electrical safety, EMC, ROS, REACH, etc. In the case of the North American market, it's similar. You have the electrical safety requirements, but you also have the EMC and radio requirements. So these are regulated by FCC in USA and Industry Canada or ISET Canada in Canada. So as, as you can see, there are two different regulators based on uh, where the country we are accessing. Now, FCC is the US regulator and regulates not only radio devices, it regulates also the electromagnetic compatibility requirement for electronic devices. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there's a big differentiation we need to do. Something is an unintentional radiator and something is an intentional radiator. Um, from here, what we can say is an unintentional radiator is something that does not contain any radio or wireless or connectivity. There are synonyms. Um, in, in general, we are covering products that contain digital circuits or electronics, which is quite vast, a majority of the products. 
you can see here in the table besides that um, there's a table of uh, many different categories of devices. As you can see, the last one says all other devices. So any device that contains electronics and digital circuits are within the scope of FCC for EMC requirements and are so-called unintentional radiators. Also receivers, radio receivers in general, are considered non-radio uh, devices. Um, and are part of this unintentional radiator category. From the other side, you have intentional radiators. And intentional radiators are devices that um, transmit and use radio frequency to uh, function, which is radio devices or uh, wireless devices um, that transmit and use um, uh, um, transmit data. Now, uh, for the non-wireless devices, FCC regulates them through the FCC subpart 15B in general. And these are the EMC requirements for an el electronic product for the US market. The way to go through that is through the supply declaration of conformity, which is similar to the CEMA marketing declaration of conformity, which I will show you later on. Um, radio transmitters, which are called intentional radiators, are, re are required to be FCC certified. So it is followed an FCC certification scheme and that we will see later on. <clears throat> Something in between is I have a product that contains a radio, but the radio is already certified. I will also talk about these very, very shortly. Next slide. So supplier declaration of conformity, as I was saying, is the uh, declaration of conformity for the US. And it's where um, uh, the responsible party uh, says that the product is in compliance with a specific rule part with some um, specific information. If you go to the next slide, um, there's also uh, the um, information of who the responsible party is. So this supply declaration of conformity needs to be signed by the responsible party. And this responsible party needs to be based in the US. So this can be the manufacturer, it can be the importer, it can be anyone with whom the European manufacturer has an agreement, but it needs to be based in the US and it will be the main point of contact for the FCC in, an, in, in, in uh, relevant to any market surveillance um, uh, investigation. Um, next slide. So here you can see an example of what a supply declaration of conformity looks like. It's uh, uh, somehow similar to the European one. It says who is the responsible party, what's the product uh, name and, and trademark, etc. And then there's a specific statement saying that the product is in compliance with the rule. Sign the responsible party. Next slide. And this needs to be done for any product that has electronics um, and uh, will require to be tested against EMC requirements, which is FCC Part 15B. Uh, so the manufacturer will have a test report in hand and will issue the su supply declaration of conformity. Instead, if a radio contains an intentional radiator, which is a transmitter, then uh, the, the requirements here will be um, the need to certify or the transmitter or the end product that contains the transmitter if the radio part is not already FCC certified. And that's a must. You cannot sell a product into the US market or Canadian market uh, that, is a, that it contains a radio transmitter and the radio transmitter is not FCC certified. So, um, this requires, this process requires uh, two steps. One is to perform the testing in an FCC authorized test lab, like for example, UL, and then to provide all relevant documentation to a certification body for the US called TCD, which also UL is, uh, has this part of the services we do. Um, and only the TCB can issue the certificate for FCC. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's something in between, which is I have um, um, 
I will be uh, doing the certification of my product, then I will need also to prepare uh, some documentation relevant to the, the transmitter part. Um, I will get an FCC certificate and this FCC certificate will be published publicly uh, so that the US authorities can check that uh, before entering the product into the market, um, the product is being properly certified. Next slide. Um, if I'm using an already certified ready model part of my design, um, then I need to follow all FCC requirements um, that are relevant to the certification of this module. If I'm using it, I'm not doing any changes or anything. Um, I, I don't need to certify my end product because the ready portion is already certified. I only need to have a look into some areas of testing um, that may be required at the end product level, but uh, certification will not be needed. If instead I do modifications to a radio model that is certified, I change the antenna, I change some conditions uh, um, from this ready model into the installation of my end product, they are allowed, but will need to be um, analyzed and identified what is the right process to follow. It may require to certify the product or it may require um, not to certify the product. This may depend on the changes you need to do. Next slide. Um, very quickly on Canada. So Canada, it's uh, regulated by, I said Canada, Industry Canada is equivalent to the FCC in Canada and has the same idea of uh, certification scheme for radio devices, radio transmitters, and EMC testing for non-radio transmitters. What I want also to show here is um, there are different standards applicable. These are for the unintentional radiators. In general, we are talking about ICES 003, but you may also consider ICES 005 for lighting equipment. And this is for EMC testing on non-radio devices. If you go to the next one. Similar to the radio standards uh, in here, just to mention a few of them and to make you aware that this is how this is approached for intentional radiators, testing in an authorized test lab, and then issuing reports, documentation, and getting the certification. In this case for Canada, the certification is issued by Canada themselves, but also a certification body needs to be involved part of the process. Next slide. Um, I will skip that one. Let's move to the next slide based on. So let's uh, do a quick summary. A device that contains electronics without any radio for the market access, US and Canada will need to do the supplier declaration of conformity. And uh, in order to do that, they will need to do testing for EMC requirements against FCC and Industry Canada standards. Um, when a product contains a radio portion, a radio transmitter, um, the manufacturer will need to um, approach a process of certification, which requires testing in an authorized test lab and the certification through a certification body. Um, and always consider the fact that other than the testing and the certification, there will be labeling and user manual requirements depending on which area and which situation you are. Very, very quick. So up to here, FCC Industry Canada certification uh, testing needs for wireless and non-wireless devices. Um, I just wanted to show you very, very quickly that we've been talking today about US and very specific to the US. But during the, the speech, uh, you have heard about international standards and the possibility sometimes because of harmonization to put together these standards with the UL and get the international coverage. What I only want to mention here is, especially for radio devices, or wireless devices, or products that contain radio technologies in it, um, you know that Europe has the Radio Equipment Directive, which regulates radio products. US and Canada have FCC and Industry Canada. Um, at a global level, it, the thing, it, 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 it's becoming more and more complicated. There's no such a harmonization globally. 
the requirements for a wireless product in Europe may be totally different from Brazil. Even Brazil will require you to do testing in Brazil of your devices because of the radio requirements. Similar from for China, there may be other countries that may accept um, FCC report and certification as a starting point to develop their local mark, for example, Chile or Colombia. And there are others like Australia, New Zealand that will use the European Radio Cream Directive test reports to issue the local mark in Australia. So just to uh, make you aware how complex the global market would be, and it's obviously something where UL can help you. We have a specific team set up here in Europe, which has a global reach that can help you on all the global scheme certifications regarding wireless and non-wireless devices. Next slide, please. So how we can help you? Um, as you can as you can see, um, we have experts in uh, all different areas, from the electrical safety of lighting devices to uh, controls and HVAC to information technology and batteries and lasers um, for the North American market. Um, next slide, please. And we have also capabilities related to any product type, uh, both from the electrical safety and FCC. Uh, also European market, we are uh, also market leaders in Europe for radio equipment directive and EMC testing. Um, and we can help you with uh, all the global market uh, needs you may have for your connected and non-connected devices. We are present, as I was saying, in different locations in Europe where we have electrical safety labs, EMC and radio labs, and uh, things related to um, interoper interoperability labs around Europe. So uh, my, in short, um, contact us to have a, a little bit more information, in-depth information of your, how to approach your product certification as a global scheme, and especially to the North American scheme, as we have mentioned today. Next slide. So with that, I want to thank everyone, the speakers today, and I want to thank every uh, one of the attendees for also the patience. We are 10 minutes out, but I think it was interesting and important to speak about all these concepts. Any uh, questions or anything, we can have, have minutes now, but we can even, if you have any specific questions, you can uh, get in contact directly with us. Here are some email addresses you may find interesting for contacting us. Thank you very much, all. Uh, thanks, Joaquin, and uh, the rest of your colleagues. Really interesting and useful information. I appreciate it. There, there is, in fact, a, a question or two in the chat box, uh, three. So uh, if you want to read them, uh, starting with, with Max, uh, or I can, I can read it for you. Uh, uh, Max is pointing uh, uh, one of the comments from Hans, uh, who said components, parts of a full device, should have the recognized components are you marking. Is this legally mandatory or is this just a recommendation so the final product can reach UL certificate easier? <clears throat> to my mind, it's, uh, it's, it's not mandatory. Because one thing is very much clear, if a component like an LED driver, for example, is not pre-certified, then the end product, uh, which is provided uh, to us, will be tested even uh, to all the requirements which come along with the LED driver. And we can skip the whole part immediately if the product is already recognized. So it's really important to do it because then from a component point of view, the final manufacturer can just more easy use the component in his end product without any additional testing. So that saves time and money. And it is uh, definitely very, very helpful if you just uh, provide a component without uh, being tested. Uh, finally, all the tests need to be done by each manufacturer and that would be ridiculous to be honest okay thank i hope you. that helps uh -huh. yeah thanks uh, a few more questions um 
Can European EMC and radio test reports be used to cover US Canada requirements? Um, I think that's that's related to my, my portion. Um, the answer is no. There's no such a MRA uh, mutual recognition agreement between the regulators, uh, between FCC and the European Commission, that uh, one accepts the other. It may happen that the requirements are very similar. So EMC testing concepts, uh, radiated emissions, conducted emissions, uh, radiated spurious emissions, these concepts are very, very similar and certain cases are performed in a similar way. But uh, just by starting the fact that a device can be, uh, um, uh, the voltage needs to be tested at 230 volts in Europe and 120 or 110 in, in the US can make a, a difference. Uh, but in general, other than these more specific details, the answer is no, they will not be accepting, US will not be accepting, especially for certification schemes, uh, European um, or test against European standards to issue the FCC certification. That, that's not going to happen. Clear. Thanks, uh, Joaquin. Uh, one more question. Um, is UL mandatory for KNX products uh, below 30, uh, 30 volts? And I assume they, they have no connection to, to mains. So basically, it's just a KNX device which is connected to a twisted pair. Uh, uh, yes, I think it's a generic uh, question that could be applicable to different products, also uh, lighting, but uh, generally speaking, uh, 30 volt DC, it is something that uh, falls under uh, class 2 power source. So if we, we read the, the National Electrical Code, it says that uh, we, we don't have a risk of uh, electric shock, risk of fire. It depends uh, uh, regarding, so we are merely the product safety portion of the evaluation. So uh, we have to check uh, carefully the type of product. So if you have like uh, some output that are connected to different different circuitry, these, the, the, the certification is, uh, let's say, is still something that can, can be shall be done because you have to be sure that regarding the spacing the different segregation between uh, different circuitry that can uh, let's say affect the the class 2 uh, power source limit so is in some cases uh, the, the product could be accepted in the field without a certification if it is uh, uh, directly connected to a, a class 2 power source without any additional connection to the circuit in other cases, even if the product is uh, in several cases, because every time you have uh, some IOs on this product, uh, the product shall be anyway evaluated by a, an RTL like UL in order to provide this, uh, let's say, confidence to the, to the final application that uh, we have a good uh, segregation, good uh, spacing between the different circuitry that are connected inside the product. Okay, thank you very much for the elaborated answer, uh, David. Uh, still time maybe for one more question. Uh, maybe this is a one million one million dollar question. Uh, how long does the whole certification process take? I understand there are different procedures depending on the product, but maybe some estimation about the the process uh, for the certification. Uh, as mentioned, for a lighting product, I can uh, easily answer. <clears throat> as mentioned, uh, if you do it really for the first time, we recommend this, uh, I would say, this different procedure where we have the so-called preliminary inspection, because as mentioned in lighting, the standards are not harmonized and you might face some, I would say, major changes in the design. But in generally speaking, uh, we have uh, turnaround times around six weeks to eight weeks. And uh, perhaps uh, if we add uh, now EMC and wireless topics, uh, that might be different. Perhaps 
uh, Joachim, you can help me out at this point. Yes, we can. Um, in general, it can be run also in parallel. The, what you need to know is uh, running uh, FCC testing in parallel with electrical safety may be positive if everything goes smooth. But if there's any failures in one or the other, this may affect the other portion of the evaluation. So we need also to, a part of UL, we have a look into the product as a whole, what we need to do, and uh, we evaluate what is the best process in order to be as efficient as possible. Um, also FCC testing, depending if it's a non-radio device or it's a radio device, it may change the process very much. A non-radio device maybe may require a couple of days testing, including reports, which is very short or, or within a week. Uh, a radio device for full certification, it may require even more than four weeks. So it may depend on the complexity and what you need, uh, what we need to do. But in general, um, these are more or less the numbers we, we, we can expect. Okay, thank you, Joaquin. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of Ken Association, I would like to thank today's experts. Thanks a lot uh, for sharing your valuable uh, knowledge with us. Uh, also, a reminder to the audience that the recording of today's webinar, including the slides, uh, will be available on demand on my KNX for our members, and a follow up email will be sent out too. Thank you very much for your participation and see you in the next KNX event. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Thanks bye. a lot Thanks. and Thank you. have a nice day and rest of the week. Bye. <laughs> you too. Bye bye.